Oh, boy. I have to say, I'm kind of honored to be sitting here with you today, Chris Pizzuro. You are practically our industry's equivalent of an EGOT winner. It's true. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a pretty tall task. But well, think about it. You're like an e-wicket. You, ha- you have an Emmy, a Webby yeah. nominee, yeah. a Cable Fax Innovation Award, an IV, ITVT Leadership Award. I can't even pronounce these. And a TVOT All-Star Award, Chris Pizzoro. Thank you. That that and the, whatever the subway costs these days will we'll get you on the subway. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's E.B. Moss, and this is episode 14 of Insider Interviews, season two. Today is another twofer. We have Chris Pizzuro. He is the principal of Leap Media, and what they're doing is creating long-form branded entertainment, and then they are also buying the media to support it. He's hitting things from both sides of the coin, so to speak. And then a surprise mystery guest, but I'm going to reveal it for you because it's great. It's Michelle Fino, and she's going to share the use case of branded entertainment like that because she is the head of branded entertainment at Crackle. So stay tuned. It's a great episode. Well, I really want to thank you for joining me. This is episode 14 of Insider Interviews. I'm going to bring on a special mystery guest a little bit into this session. But Chris, I want to start with you. Where are you recording from today? I am just north of uh, New York City, up in Westchester County. Okay, my old stomping grounds. Well, aside from the geographical location. Let's talk about your historical location, starting with your previous couple of gigs. Yeah, sure. Um, I really grew up uh, cutting my teeth in this industry with uh, 12 years at, at Turner Broadcasting, and that was within the sales group in New York City. And you know, starting in the way, way back machine, EB, in the, in the 1990s, I had the honor of working with Ted Turner directly on the Goodwill Games uh, with another gentleman, Mark Lazarus, who now runs all of NBCU. So Mark's done a little bit better than I have, but you know, we're both, we're both, <laughs> still, uh, we're both still in the game. Um, I really learned about media buying uh, and selling under a gentleman named Barry Fisher. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and as it relates to this topic of branded entertainment, we were actually doing branded entertainment in the 2000s with TBS's Dinner in a Movie. You can, oh, you I can remember that. that. You can Google good old Dinner in a Movie. Yep. And uh, where, you know, we would run the sprockets off of Pretty Women every <laughs> Friday night. My favorite uh, movie, just saying. Uh, well, there you go. And I really did learn that um, clients would pay additional money uh, to have their product um, highlighted. Right, whether that was in a movie or just in this case adjacent to a movie, but it's mm-hmm. really my first lesson. And they 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 will pay extra money to have their brand associated with entertainment one way or another. So that was working on linear. Then when digital came along, I moved over to the digital group, started broadband video, uh, which led to uh, set top box VOD, which mm-hmm. um, led me to my time at Canoe. And VOD because we're going to talk acronyms later with our surprise mystery guest, is Video On Demand. And then we're going to talk about its evolution a little bit, too. And what was Canoe? Because I sure remember how cutting edge it was. But why don't you explain some of those more memorable lessons that came out of that and how it led you to what you're doing now? So uh, at my time at Turner on Set Top Box VOD was we were having to if we sold a VOD campaign, we had to burn the ad into the actual creative. Uh, in podcasting, and we call that baked in, right? There Same thing? Okay. You were, you were baked in, and, and, and that was you know, uh, all the drawbacks of that. So uh, when Canoe called and said, you know, we want to have it so you can dynamically place ads into VOD, do you know anything about it? I said, hallelujah, I'll tell you all about it. Um, <laughs> So it really, that product was really the OG of what is now um, server-side ad insertion, where today we just assume that CTV and fast, you're going to be able to insert an ad uh, into a video stream. And uh, we really pioneered that. And that's where the Emmys and the patents behind me come (laughs) into play is, you know, we went out and built systems in order to do that. 
Uh, and that business really peaked around 2017. And, and like I said, now has morphed uh, really into now what is CTV and, and fast channels and server side ad insertion. More acronyms, CTV, <laughs> Connected TV. We will talk about FAST in, in just a minute. All right, right, so you have been at the forefront of so many new innovations or use cases of advertising and television combined. So I think that that's led you to another innovation. Tell us about what you're doing at Leap Media Group. In addition to still having server-side ad insertion and planning and buying 30-second spots, and that's a, that's a, a cornerstone of Leap, um, we've also gone back to sort of those branded entertainment roots of mine from dinner and a movie, and we have a flagship product that um, we call long-form brand engagement. And for us, that is one form of branded entertainment, and our, our special guest will come out soon and, and tell us about that person's uh, version of it. Um, but for Leap's version, um, it's, it's a subset of branded entertainment and also merging the hot topic of shoppable TV. So um, like branded entertainment, it's about a client being involved in a show or movie from the outset, right? Okay. They, they, they have a piece of the action, they are forming the narrative. However, um, Within long form brand engagement, we fix the time span. We say it's a half hour show um, and there are specific calls to action. That's part of the engagement during uh, the show. So it is a mix of branded entertainment and a mix of shoppable for the ROI of the brand. Okay, uh, amazing. And you are calling this LFBE, <laughs> yeah, another acronym that doesn't really uh, flow out of the mouth, but it does explain the product. Long form branded entertainment. <laughs> I got it. Um, so what were some of the things that you figured out while you were at Canoe and Turner that helped you apply those lessons now with LFBE at Leap? Um, oh my gosh. So I have a bunch of Ted Turner stories and I'll give you an example okay. of one time I was uh, with Mr. Turner and he said, uh, he said, uh, Chris, you know why I bought MGM? <laughs> and I said, Mr. Turner, I don't know why. Why did you buy MGM? And he said, well, let me tell you, I can take those cartoons. I can make something called Cartoon Network. I can run them around the world all for the same price. And I don't have to dub in any voices because it's just music. I said, oh. genius, <laughs> right? genius. <laughs> buy it cheap, run it around the world. You don't have to do anything to it. So I'm in a client meeting uh, mm -hmm. about a year ago and they were talking about doing a St. Patrick's Day show. There was a theme right. around a, a two week window. And we were talking about time frames, and I pulled out that story and then the client stopped and he said, well, then why are we doing a St. Patrick's Day special? Why aren't we planning to run it for three or four months and call it a spring special? And that's what we did. And the economics just worked so much better. Mm -hmm. So you never know, EB, you know, yep. what those experiences are and when something triggers and you pull it out from, you know, to a client and you look real smart. Yeah. So that worked. And economies of scale. And economies of scale. Yes. Excellent. Well, that's genius. And speaking of genius. Oh, boy, what a lead in. <laughs> I want to bring on your surprise mystery guest. She is another erudite, esteemed industry expert. It's Michelle Fino from Crackle, Crackle Connects. Hello, Michelle. Yes. Hello. I'm unveiling myself. <laughs> Thank out of the, you. Out of the sweatshirt. I feel yes. very mysterious. Yes. Thank you for having me. Well, I know that Chris wanted to have you here to share a case study, but I'm also going to look at you as our resident expert, because even though it's all about Chris, AAC, uh, I would really love your additional perspective on the industry. And I did promise that you would identify some acronyms. So More acronym okay. soup, yes. Let's... People, LOL, yes. <laughs> let's explain <laughs> to the people why you are the Branton Entertainment Maven. Oh boy. Oh, no. I think um, starting off um, at some point working at Fremantle on shows like American Idol and America's Got Talent and The Price is Right 
my boss at the time was like, your title is now sponsorship, integrated marketing, live events, digital content, and other. Um, <laughs> I was like, that doesn't even fit on a business card, even a British shaped business card. So I think we should just call it branded entertainment. Perfect. And he said, what's that? And I said, everything you just said. <laughs> um, and it's funny, even coming into Crackle um, about 15 months ago, it's, you know, is it branded content or branded entertainment? And I was a big fan of entertainment over content because the experience could live beyond the show, mm -hmm. right? So to Chris's point, like, it could live in our world on a red box kiosk with a dinner and a movie, but in the digital world space, um, it could live at a live event, you know, mm -hmm. and I could bring talent and clips and never before seen clips from a show to Art Basel or to South by. So really entertainment is the top of the top of the marketing funnel. Yes. Having been worked at a brand before and you've got kind of right hand, left hand, you've got a team of people focused on brand awareness, and then you have a team of people focused on demand, the bottom mm -hmm. half of the funnel and transaction. Um, and above brand awareness is entertainment. At the end of the day, we watch good shows. Yeah, good content, no matter whether it's at an event or on a fast channel. But you dropped a couple of things in there. You mentioned Redbox. You mentioned that you work at Crackle. And there's some really interesting things going on with your company, but explain what your company is, who owns it, and give us just a little bit of the background. Absolutely. So Crackle is one of the OGs in AVOD, another which of course stands OG. for another OG, <laughs> yes, uh, advertiser video on demand. So taking a step back in the world of acronym soup, um, connected TV, of course, internet televisions, TVs are the internet, internet is TV. Um, the, in the VOD space, video on demand, you get to choose what television show you want to watch when you want to watch it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you also now get a choice between SVOD. Am I going to pay $27.99 a month for this service? Or am I going to choose an AVOD and suck it up and watch commercials? Right. Um, Got it. and then there is also fast, which stands for free ad supported television. So there are fast channels, like one of the more popular fast channels in the Crackle universe is Cops. We have all the episodes of Cops just continuously oh. running on a channel. It is not on demand. So it's not like I specifically want to watch this episode. I see. You know, it's, it's just constantly running. Yeah. Um, it's like, to your point, if Pretty Woman was just on cable, you would sit down and watch the rest of it. Yeah. Right? So the... Um, and then there's, of course, TVOD, uh, which which stands for transactional video on demand. That okay. is not free. You are paying to rent or paying to own a download of Barbie, as an example. We now have Barbie on our platform. Okay. So that's what the T stands for. It's like it doesn't stand so for TV. So almost like the one-offs. I could get it if that appeared on my SVOD service, or I could buy it as a one-off. Is that something that Redbox does, for example? Right. So okay. you can do, there's multiple ways to watch things and either it's baked into OEMs or through the service providers, um, everything from like Amazon and Apple all the way through to Vizio and Zumo. I know Zumo doesn't start with a Z, but I was kind of trying to do a name. <laughs> Everyone's always like, how do I watch Crackle? And I think it's funny with my parents. I think this is the first job I've had where it's literally the orange button on their Vizio TVs. It's kind of foolproof. So oh. there we go. Well, and I want to thank you for allowing me on Crackle to watch my back seasons of Doc Martin. There you go. I know. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so, all right. Given the confluence of what's happening here, the nature of the industry, all of these different ways to watch and consume, is that what makes... Chris's LFBE, his long form brand and entertainment approach work well today? Is, uh, is the environment ripe for something like that? It is because if you integrate a brand or an mm -hmm. advertiser from the onset, as Chris had said, and then later you decide to travel the show, you know, the tr uh, Chris shoots the show and then decides Crackle would, or Redbox or Chicken Soup for the Soul would be a good home for it that brand integration stays with the show. So as long as it's something that the brand is still in fact marketing mm -hmm. uh, and wants brand awareness for, that's great. You don't have to reshoot anything. You don't have to worry about any clearances and all that other production nonsense. The show travels with the distribution deal. 
Another great example of that is like if um, if you have a show where you have to digitally insert or digitally take out stuff from a show, it's just another layer to the process. It's mm -hmm. not impossible, but it 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 is much easier if you just have a, a an L F. I wrote that down. L F V E. I think you should get matching <laughs> um, bicep tattoos, yeah. Chris. I like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll work on that. Yeah, there we go. And then from an ad sales perspective, so unlike Chris, I do not have a decade long illustrious career working for some of the ad tech icons in this industry. Um, I've only been either at a production company or at a brand. I've probably set foot in every single agency in in Manhattan, but mm -hmm. never as an employee, right? And so, so you're I, not an e wisset winner. An e wisset winner, which is also another like, I could have my daughter make you an e wisset out of Play-Doh or something, Chris. Um, but <laughs> the, um, the therefore, it, the way that my brain works, it's the overlap of how television shows are produced and marketed and successful um, with, of course, entertainment first. Nobody will watch the, you know, the yep. brand KPI show or the ROAS <laughs> show, right? So, um, and most people don't even know what those acronyms stand for. And then on the marketing side, it's knowing that you have to hit, you know, every dollar you spend, you want it to come back 2X for you. Yep. And if there's a way to do that in size and scale and scope, you know, you literally invest in something like American Idol in the beginning, and then it ends out to be this giant juggernaut of a phenomenon. Um, and or investing in an organization like Crackle Connects, where you can purchase every dollar you spend kind of goes towards not only Crackle integration into the shows with me, but then you've got run of network media units across all of Crackle. Um, and then you also have 32,000 Redbox kiosks, which is kind of the last man standing as it relates to DVD rentals R Redbox, in this country. As in the get a DVD physically. Yep. And, in, you know, all the grocery, most of the grocery stores and, and pharmacies in this country. Wow. I didn't know this, but there are more red box machines in the United States than there are Starbucks and McDonald's combined. Stop it. <laughs> Hello, Tara Kassin. Yes, <laughs> exactly. You're missing an opportunity. <laughs> and it's like you just, you know, you see people just stand there and boop, 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 boop. And it's, wow. uh, it's, it's quite fascinating how algorithmically you can start to predict, you know, people like yeah. these kinds of movies. People will also love a two for one pizza. People will also love, you know, these television shows on Amazing. Crackle. So we're now that we're about a year in uh, after the acquisition of Redbox, getting great at kind of the cross promotion across our platforms. So it's the long tail of old school that, you know, sometimes we still love. Absolutely. Okay. And you forget like that, you know, we live in New York or L.A. and we fly over this big hunk in um, United States of America where, you know, in rural areas, there's still 39 percent of the country that don't that doesn't have high speed Internet. So yep. um and more and more, a bigger percentage of the pie chart of Americans with high-speed internet are looking for way, budget ways to cost, you know, cut costs their monthly expenses. Yeah. And if that means getting rid of some of the expensive SVODs that they signed up yeah. for a couple years ago, or maybe they got a year for free with this phone plan or whatever, like, um, it's like, do I really need to spend $30 a month? You're, you're preaching to the choir. So yep. this means that when Chris... And now we're back to AAC. Um, all about Chris. When you're providing quality content, that helps crackle out and it helps the advertiser out. Because if I go back to Michelle's original point, if it's it's all entertainment, it's got to be good entertainment for you to sort of navigate all of this fragmentation. Am I getting this right? Uh, yes, and, and Michelle touched on something which is a, which is a key part. You know, the entertainment stuff's wonderful, um, but if you create a good show and if a tree falls in the <laughs> woods and no one hears it, you know, so if no one, if no one did Discovery or no one saw that show, um, you know, it's wonderful you made it, but there's an element of so what. Um, so that's why uh, with every long form brand engagement that we make and we distribute it out to various points. We love the fact that there's folks like Crackle that um, in addition to, to distributing out the show, that there is media 
that's uh, attached to the, the platform, that Leap can then use our ad network that I spoke about to buy um, tune-in promotional spots to drive awareness and viewership to the show. Wow, so wow, wow, wow. That is it. Yeah, so that's a, a key element it's, it's to whole, everything that we do. It's, a it's whole, that it all works together, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's key, and that's you know, a wonderful thing about, about the folks at Crackle that they, they do uh, they lend us it. that ability to, yeah. right, to be able to buy a tune-in campaign uh, so that people can discover and watch the, the program. And the, our tune-ins are created so they really are mini trailers um, so that the consumer is already predisposed to what the show's going to tell them, right? Yeah. So they really are treated that way. So for instance, uh, we have a show, a few shows with uh, Expedia. Uh, one was on West Virginia, Panama. We have a show on the D Dominican Republic coming up. And those trailers, they already predispose the person to Panama and, you know, the, the trailer of the show. So they already have it in mind. So, you know, if and when they actually show up to watch the show, when that brand engagement comes up of that call to action, right? That's not the first time it's in their brain that mm -hmm. they're going to they're gonna see it. They've already seen, probably already seen the trailer. Then they're going to already see the first seven minute segment of the show. Then they're going to get hit with that brand engagement. Um, so it's that combination that's that's very powerful. Amazing. So uh, just tell me briefly again, your media network, explain what that is again. On one end, we have a, a bunch of sellers who have inventory. And on the other end, we have our programs and or just normal ad buyers. And so the key is that when we do make a show, we can leverage that ad network two ways. First is what we just spoke about in terms of uh, having a, a tune-in campaign with the platform in order to drive viewership. Um, but the second thing we do, if the brand wants us to do this, and some brands do, some brands don't, but we can actually put our own commercial breaks into the brand and entertainment show so we can take our ads and already put them wow. into the show. So much like akin to old school syndication, right? What's yeah. old is what's new again. Um, so actually do um, stitch in the ad into the show. And like Michelle said, not only now is the entertainment traveling with the show, but the ads are traveling with the show. Um, and that in turn defrays the cost of production for the, uh, uh, our co-producers because I can share that ad revenue with them, you know, right from the get go. Okay. So let me reframe a little bit because mm. what I see is that you're like playing symbols with your knees, Chris, you're buying, you're selling, you're producing, you're distributing. I, I want to talk about to, to which to which Lisa, my wife says, what do you do again? And I'm like, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody's going to have to replay this episode seven times slowly. Okay. Um, so with all of these, you know, related parts, how do you pull it all together? How do you uh, kind of begin the process? And what's most important to someone like Michelle? Yeah, and, and I'm sure like Michelle, and, and like she said, years of, of doing this, right? That it really starts from that question to, to the brand, to the client of what do you want out of this, right? Mm. Just, you know, if, if you're just going to throw your brand up there and not expect anything back, look, that may be fine with you. But if you're expecting an ROI, let's talk about what that is. So, you yeah. know, in the case of our Expedia client, it's we want people to book a trip to Panama. Um, in the case of our cooking show, it's they want people to sign up for their community and or they want to sell cookbooks. If there is a very specific ROI, um, and then we back everything up from there. You start to say, okay, what does that production need to look like? What does that distribution need to look like? What does the tuna need to look like? It's really trying to track all those moving parts. And, you know, this is a very holistic approach. And it, you know, really starts with the ROI and starts with the big Excel spreadsheet to sort of lay it all out and get the plan signed off ahead of time. Got it. And just by way of reminder of that acronym, ROI, return on investment, ROAS, mm -hmm. return on ad spend. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just, I'm just wondering if this kind of helps you um, satisfy some cravings to be a, a Quentin Tarantino or a, a Coppola or something. But in all seriousness, how do you, how do you create a show 
that is branded entertainment, but, you know, not only delivers that ROI, but is, as Michelle said, at the top of the food chain, so to speak, entertaining. Uh, yeah, and that is it, right? It, it really is that combination of, again, with brand engagement on the engagement side, it's the ROI. And I so agree with, with Michelle, and that's why we see eye to eye on so many things when it comes to this. Um, and that's, it starts with great storytelling, right? You yeah. have to have a story and more importantly, characters that you care what happens to them, right? Mm -hmm. If both those don't develop, uh, then the consumer's not gonna care and they're gonna tune out and they're not even gonna make it into the seven minute commercial break. Um, so I think it all you know, starts and ends with uh, great characters and great storytelling. All right, Michelle, who's your favorite character? In, <laughs> Other than Chris, in oh. LFBE, <laughs> the it's funny because um, to reiterate on it and strengthen the, one of the things that Chris had said, there's a big difference between a video and a show, right? right. Um, and mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, you have to remind people, sometimes producers, oftentimes brands, the difference. Um, I have a two-year-old daughter, therefore I have ten thousand six hundred and seventy-one videos of her on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, none of that is a show. There is a difference. There needs to be a story arc. There's character development. Is it dramatic? Is it funny? You know, is it a how-to and informative? You know, so you, it's just because you know we all have a video camera on us at all times doesn't necessarily make you a television producer. Um, so yeah, that's definitely one piece of it. I also like, to answer your question on the like, who's a great, you know, BE piece of talent, we work a lot with Genevieve Gorder, and she is the perfect television, home shopping, um, take her out on the street and just grab people and interview them about, you know, favorite pizza or dumplings or <laughs> recycled jewelry or whatever the case may be. She's such a warm personality and human being. She's a mom. She's like instantly relatable to like everyone. So, yeah. I, you know, and the fact that she is also one of the OGs in the BE space, I think did the first Swiffer deal in 20 in 2001 for one of her shows then you know everything is not just one thing so if you see that you have a show production coming up in December mm -hmm. okay I'm only going to get the talent the set the DP the mics the lights everything for these three days what else can I shoot even if it hits the cutting room floor and it doesn't make it in the 30 minute episode, well, what else can I shoot for social? What else can I shoot for bumpers or interstitials? What can I even shoot that could turn into a 30 for a brand, right? And then give it to them uh, after the fact. So um, maximizing that at the production of a show as an asset itself, um, we've had great success with that. Um, a show that we did four seasons of going from broke one of our partners was DoorDash, and they integrated into an episode. One of the people in the show became a dasher to make extra money. The, the 30s that we shot for them that became their kind of bumpers in between the show and the commercial time, those turned out so well for them, they asked if they could use them as their actual commercials on other paid digital and social platforms. Wow. And luckily, I knew about those kinds of things and you make sure you have the right media releases for everyone ahead of time. So this is where it also, it's like every brand is like, I want to be a producer. It's like, do you, do you know about, you know, guild and media releases yeah, and yeah. all that good fun stuff? It's like you sell food. I don't want to sell food. Right. I well, will make shows. True. You and deliver I, food. I'll sell shows. Yeah. I did ask Chris if he was afraid of uh, real, revealing some trade secrets um, in front of you as you guys are doing something together now. We are. So it's funny that a, a um, branded entertainment, even though as a consumer, you're on your couch, you've got your, your remote or your phone and you're scrolling through um, and you end up watching a show. How that show got there yeah. can happen in a myriad of ways, as Chris has kind of already said. For Crackle, we could make a show regardless of brand investment, right? We just know it's a good show. It needs to get out there. Um, you know, a show like Getting People Out of Debt, like Going From Broke, or a show yeah. like Wedding Talk with Sarah Lipinski. People want to see beautiful weddings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or a brand can come in and say, I've got this budget and this brief. You got anything about dogs? And then literally like 
Yeah. yeah. I've got a working title show called Barkitecture. How about you buy that? Can you change the name so it's not just about dogs? Sure, we'll okay, call I'll it Pet it. Caves instead of Man Caves. <laughs> so the 10 episodes of that was born just out of a, a, a meeting and a budget, right? Okay. Um, in some cases, you're talking to a media agency, one of those big media houses during the upfronts, and they're already about to drop, you know, a multi-million dollar investment to run units across our platform, Upways and Sideways. And then it's like, well, what if I were to strip out, say, 10% of that budget, which is enough to make a TV show, I can still run the media I.O. at a very competitive CPM with or without that production budget, and you get a show, mm. you know? And then you, Agency X, can turn around and sell that show and the integrations in it back to your clients. Um, and then, of course, the third way that you could budget out a show is all about Chris a rich person. Yeah. Well, and or a rich person, like, believe it or not, there are oh. some people out there that just want an IMDb profile and yeah. like, here's a big check. Go yeah. make a show. OK. But what's happening now um, is in, yes, the relationship with Chris is kind of the fourth wall, Ooh. Uh, which is he is sitting on a library of great content that was funded by a brand at some point and they want more eyeballs against it. Yeah. So there's nothing that like gets me more, it gets me all riled up. It, when you're sitting with a brand or a production company and you say, wow, it's, you, I, I saw your fill in the blank at Tribeca or Sundance. What's the distribution strategy? Well, what do you mean? We got into Tribeca, that's it. Uh huh. So you, you, your client paid $5 million for you to shoot something and you wanted the 355 people in this room to see it? That's it? Yeah. Wow, that's a really expensive <laughs> So you must want people to see the content. Oh, well, so yeah, I guess we'll talk, we'll talk to Netflix and Hulu. Right. Well, that's instead, great. Instead, you're coming yeah. in with all but of the crackle crackle's free. Like, mm -hmm. what? Got it. So, I love it. Oh, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, so, exactly. And then he's yeah. also coming in with the tune-in, right? So you're not only satisfying the production uh, and the brand that's behind that, but then Crackle is also benefiting from driving more of your Crackle eyeballs to a show like Bigger Boulder Baking or something like that. Exactly. Right? Well, and like a, especially a travel show or a food show, uh -huh. like... If one episode is about West Virginia and one episode is about Panama, I'm willing to bet my left arm a partner like an Expedia can tell us okay. the, the highest probability of where people live that book vacations in those two places. Yeah. Hey, Chris, you want to buy out all the ads on Redbox kiosks to drive tune in to that show in those states? Right. It just makes sense. You could, it, it, it's all the same question that you right. ask a producer or you ask a brand partner which is, what do you want people to do after they've seen this show? And the answer could be buy more Skittles, book a trip, it doesn't matter. But then how do you kind of lead everybody to that path um, by reverse engineering the creative? Chris, are there any verticals that are particularly effective for branded entertainment? I mean, I'm hearing travel and I'm hearing cooking. Can an actuarial firm <laughs> have a compelling show? Um, yeah, I, I, exactly right. Travel uh, with Expedia, we've been able to do wonderful work and with uh, bigger, bolder baking, cooking and, and like Michelle, like, you know, it's just sort of, you know, we all know those are two very good, broad categories. We also are, are in early you know, mid stages with business shows. Um, we believe that there is an unfulfilled niche there of mm storytelling um, about the brands themselves of their, their early days and you know kind of a, a behind right. the music except for businesses and brands yeah um, that there's you know every every business has a extremely interesting story perfect I want to personalize this a little bit um, your respective careers are illustrious and and I want to talk a little bit about things that influenced you and also how you bring some of the personal to not only the content that you create, but also the people that you work with or what you personally stand for. So I'm curious about, A, if you ever try to influence one of your clients to do more cause marketing or speak to something of value or B, what you're personally involved with. And uh, Michelle, I'm going to start with you for a quick answer because I know that you have um, a pretty strong background in working with causes. 
Yep. And um, I think it can be summed up when I first met Bill Ruhanna during my interview process. The CEO and chairman of uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul, which is the big parent company, Chicken Soup for the Soul purchased majority stake of Crackle from Sony. But when I was interviewing, he asked me a similar question, which is like, what is it that you want out of and what do you want to bring to this organization? And I said, we're Chicken Soup for the Soul. <laughs> we, we have an opportunity to put more soul back into entertainment. That is your right? brand. Yeah. And I th- again, I don't want to m- produce altruism shows. No one will watch sad cats and dogs behind bars for 30 minutes listening <laughs> to Sarah McLaughlin. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and those exist. There's plenty of philanthropists out there who have built production companies yes. um, that are just making, you know, green shows for green people about greenwashing, right? right. Um, as an example. Um, this is not that. This is purple. This It is intentionally purple. It is how do you take a television show about getting people out of debt or about extraordinary weddings um, and introduce viewers, maybe 30 some odd of the 50 weddings featured in that 10 episode series were LGBTQ weddings or cross religious weddings. Um, maybe 50% of Genevieve's guests were LGBTQ and diverse yes. and whatever. It, it, but that's not how the show was marketed and it's not how the show was produced. It's just it was part just of its brand DNA. A natural oh, reflection. Got it. Um, I don't even think I realized it at the time, but I look back on this moment in 2000, I think it was four or five. I was sitting in the live studio audience of American Idol um, after physically running around, making sure, you know, Ryan Seacrest says Coca-Cola and not just Coke, right? Um, And all the graphics are good. Um, And there was a medley by the top three contestants, which was uh, at the time Latoya London, Fantasia Barrino, and Jennifer Hudson. It was not a black women singing show. It was not black or diversity money that mm-hmm. paid for that show. It was just a reflection of the best three singers in America at that time. Sorry, not sorry, right? Yeah. And then the very following year, you've got Adam Lambert up in the finale uh, performing with Queen, right? I think the beauty of these unscripted or loosely scripted shows, the creative just kind of takes over. It's, it's You're less beholden to like the rigidness of a story and kind of letting the story and in that case the competition kind of just flow um but i think that's what we have to get how do we get back to something like that where the shows that we're making are just a positive reflection of the 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 good things that are going on in this country and if there are subtle ways of you know if we're going to do a home improvement show or an extreme home show where we gift a family Um, a home and there's like an element at the end where she gets her first driver's license and we you know she also gets to register to vote uh, and therefore she gets to get car insurance and all those things it's like oh yeah every show in our lifetime where they gift somebody a home there (laughs) should be a moment where the person uses their new address to register to vote wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to have in right. every show that would, that involved home makeovers, right? Um, or in every stand and stir cooking show, you just see the hands push away the potato peels and the lemon rinds into a compost bucket. It's not hard. It doesn't add any difficult element of production. It's just very subtle, subconscious reminders for the viewers. I can do that. Um, that was so beautifully illustrated. And let's just bring it back for a second now to maybe the advice that you would give someone new to media and advertising, Chris, after, you know, such a a terrific tenure in this space. I consider you a leader. Um, I'm so pleased that I've known you for as long as I have and have seen you through so many companies. How do you grow a leader these days? What, What do you tell those coming up in the industry? Well, first of all, Michelle, such a wonderful answer to the previous question. There's there's a rule in in uh, in speaking, right? Don't follow kids and pets. And Michelle <laughs> or and Michelle. Michelle Fino, yeah, or Michelle <laughs> Fino when she's talking about what brand and entertainment can be. So, Eb, I'm glad you pivoted to the next question. Thank you. Um, it, for me, it's something I learned again from Turner years and years and years ago from a, a gentleman who ran CNN at the time, CNN Sales, Larry Goodman. And um, 
he he taught me uh, in sales and you know in everything for that matter right it's about it's trust mm -hmm. it is trust when you are sitting you know whether you're sitting in front of a brand pitching them a million dollar idea or you're working with some startup or um you're working in a soup kitchen like whatever it may be um the person on the other end is thinking one thing can i trust this person who's across from me yeah right? human nature to me boils down with trust and i've always tried to do you know the the best that i can um within that these days um you know people are calling it transparency um yeah. and you know it, it takes on different forms but to me at the end of the day is uh you know can i trust this person and from a business point of view uh, am i going to have egg on my face dealing with this person so i think um trust and transparency goes a real long way in you know whether that's personal or business relationships i love that and i'll also kind of bring it back just for a second to the business just to put a fine point on that which is we talk a lot about um trust and brand safety and the two are not always hand in hand but i can't imagine anything that would drive more trust than a believable host and an informative story that's entertaining because it's also organically because it's their own content a brand safe environment so that that was pretty smart right oh, well that was a good wrap up there eb all right well, thank you so much, Chris Pizzuro, Michelle Fino. Um, this was just terrific. You really have raised the bar and, and built so many new areas, respectively, that I want to thank you for being on Insider Interviews and giving us good insider scoop today. Thank, thank you. Me. Well, I hope you got some good insider scoop from this episode of Insider Interviews with me, E.B. Moss. If you enjoyed this content, please feel free to buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Moss Appeal. And I hope you'll follow Insider Interviews on social media and let me know if you have a question or a suggestion for a next stellar guest in media, marketing, and advertising. Speaking of stellar, my theme music was composed and performed by the incomparable Grammy-winning John Clayton. If I can help you with your company's podcast, please find me at mossappeal.com. Thanks again for listening.